bars of knowledge and tapping into existing pools of knowledge. Let me expound on this. WECON is fully consonant with our department's mission and the UAAA strategy that has three pillars, access, agility, and alignment. Our department and the wider UWI recognize that stakeholders in our developing countries cannot simply be passive beneficiaries of policies, solutions, and technologies created and spilt over to us by our developed counterparts. We must also be active donors. We must hoard high levels of knowledge in economics and other related disciplines. We must use this knowledge to design pragmatic solutions for our own benefit and for the benefit of other developing countries. After all, no country, well, no developed country has achieved a high level of sustainable development without investing in human capital deepening and critical thinking. One way for us to unlock and hoard knowledge is to engage in direct and edifying interactions with researchers who are recognized worldwide as polygons, sorry, paragons in their discipline. To put action to this view, for a week on 2019, we are pleased to have Jeffrey Woolridge, distinguished professor at the Michigan State University, as our keynote speaker. His presence is an opportunity for us to build new knowledge by standing on the shoulders of giants. So you see, WECON is not an exercise in futility. It's one of our department's foremost initiatives. I believe that in life, we must give credit to where credit is due. So I'm gonna talk, give you a brief history about WECON. The idea for WECON was broached by Dr. Damian King, a former head of our Department of Economics, and continued under his successor, Professor David Tennant. For bringing WECON to fruition, I must thank Dr. King and Professor Tennant for their vision and leadership during their tenure at the helm of the Department of Economics. At the onset of the idea for WECON, we were mere enthusiastic novices in conference planning. Somehow I thought that it was gonna take us three months to put on a conference. Don't ask me what I was thinking, drinking or smoking. Later on, you'll learn from Dr. Spencer what happens when you drink and smoke. And then you'll understand why I had the idea that we were gonna take three months to do this thing. It took us over two years to create a workable template for the launch of WECON, over two years. So it would be remiss of me to not thank our WECON committee for their dedication. I would like to thank Dr. Patrice Whiteley, she's not in here at the moment, she's outside your man on the floor, and Ms. Marja Bryan, who's also outside, you'll meet them later on, who serve in the capacity of co-coordinators. I would also like to thank Dr. Samuel Brathwaite, he's our photographer over there, and Dr. Nikisha Spencer. Dr. Spencer, you're on your phone, that's so naughty, can you wave? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> So I'd like to thank Drs. Brathwaite and Dr. Spencer uh, who commit their talents without reservation and preconditions to help ensure a successful WECON. By the way, this is the Dr. Patrice Whiteley that I was talking about, the Dr. Patrice Whiteley, all right? Oh, by the way, she provides us with um, cheap sugar drinks and snacks during our meetings, and so we're always high on energy in those WECON meetings, all right. Our admin team, of course, also provides complimentary support to WECON, so I want to publicly thank them for their unwavering efforts. Each year, we relish the privilege of having our conference in this beautiful building, the regional headquarters of the University of the West Indies, I wish to express sincere gratitude to Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, for his generosity in hosting us on an annual basis in this remarkable conference facility. 
Before coming to a close of these remarks, I would like to remind you, and especially our session chairs, to interpret our time sh schedule as a binding constraint, and therefore not to let any session go beyond the allotted time. I would like to encourage our international participants to explore some aspects of our Jamaican culture. To our first timers, I hope you don't view WeCon as part of your conference bucket list, but as part of your annual conference calendar, because WeCon is an annual event. I would like to commend our graduate students who have taken part in WeCon. I encourage you to continue to think critically about the use of research to provide feasible solutions to the challenges we face in Jamaica and in the Caribbean. I would like to implore other graduate students to embark on a research journey to influence policy by making unique contributions predicated on analytic data-driven rigor of germane economic issues that affect us. I would like to applaud all of you who have taken part in WeCon and encourage you to find opportunities in the, in the future to collaborate with each other. I wish you a rewarding and thoughtful discussion and a lovely dinner to conclude our WeCon. Thank you so much for your participation. I now invite Professor David Tennant, our Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, to give his remarks. Thank you. Chairperson Dr. McLeod, Professor Woolridge, distinguished guests, local scholars, scholars visiting from overseas, colleagues, students, friends all, good morning. Two aspects of my life that I have accepted as immutable realities are that time flies and change is inevitable. Just last year, I was welcoming you all as the head of the Department of, of, of Economics to our second installment of WECON. Today, as Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, I'm now just an invitee to this very special occasion. So in this capacity, it's even more special to me to see the hosting of the third, now annual, West Indies Economic Conference weekend, and to see the burden firmly placed on somebody else's shoulders. <laughs> I, having just been a minor part of this team up to last year, I've seen the hard work, the considerable amount of time that has been expended in the Department of Economics to launch various initiatives, aimed at improving our research, our teaching, and our advocacy. I'm happy to see that WECON, one of those initiatives, is now a staple in the Department of Economics. I want to congratulate the department. It takes commitment. It takes a strong urge to see the growth of our institutions, our members, this wider society, to dedicate their resources to the hosting of such a conference. And I'm excited and honored to have yet another chance to meet with the co-hosts, the discussants, the chairs, the presenters, the moderators that this conference has facilitated. I especially want to thank our new head of department, Dr. Nadine McLeod, for continuing with the impetus. I want to thank her supporting team, Dr. Patrice Whiteley, Ms. Marjorie Bryan, all the academic and administrative staff in the Department of Economics for the work and the dedication that they have put in to make this year's conference possible. Today, the world is changing at a fast pace, and the problems that we face are complex. National, regional, and global solutions are required, necessitating a coming together of thought leaders and researchers to find the solutions. This coming together is evident in this conference through the collaboration that is already taking place amongst lecturers and collaborators here internationally, amongst our students, our past students, the public and private sectors who continue to engage with us and to support us in this initiative. The vision of the Department of Economics is not only to position this conference as being a leading economic conference in the Caribbean, but to be amongst the list of go-to conferences in the Western Hemisphere. This conference has and continues to facilitate high-level presentations and discussions from leading professors across the globe. Previous conferences have hosted as keynote speakers Professor Irie Hillman from bar -Ilan University in Israel, distinguished Professor Eli Tema from Harvard University. This year's keynote speaker is none other than Professor Jeffrey Woolridge, distinguished professor from Michigan State University. All of these gentlemen have written textbooks that our students use today. And as if you weren't already impressed, and I'm surprised that you didn't say this, in line for next year's conference is Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton University, Janet Khoury. This is evidence of the, 
outstanding opportunities that this conference provides for future discourse. At the end of this year's sessions, we could have hosted almost 97 presentations by researchers from more than 30 universities from numerous countries, including economists based in the Caribbean, Africa, South Pacific, North America. It allows for diversity of perspectives on and approaches to a common set of issues affecting primarily small developing states. Papers have been and will be presented in areas such as governance and taxation, health and labor, development, energy, finance, tourism, trade, and education, all very relevant issues faced by our region. Not only does the society stand to be benefit from this conference, but more narrowly, WECON also helps us in the Faculty of Social Sciences to achieve two of our critical goals on our strategic plan. One is to increase the research output of our faculty members. Noteworthy is the fact that of the about 100 presentations in the three-year span, 44 have been from our lecturers and professors here at UE Mona, and you are to be commended for this. And the second goal that I'll mention here is to improve our student experience. As you'll see in your program, two of our students will be presenting papers this year, and many of them are in attendance here. Students presenting at our conferences are just attending the conference, are exposed to a high level of discourse that they otherwise would not have been exposed to. So I'm confident that this conference will continue to provide our participants with stimulating experience through exposure to cutting edge research, a variety of perspectives, so that the complex problems in our society and region can be improved. On this note, I again want to thank the private and public sector institutions who continue to identify this conference as important and therefore lend their support. I want to thank everyone for bringing their experience and expertise around the table to engage in fruitful, constructive, and open exchanges for the next two days. You know, with all the noise in the political circles that has captured the attention and the, of the media and the wider public in Jamaica, these two days of scholarly engagement will provide a useful respite as we continue to examine and seek solutions for the deep-seated problems of our country and region. I look forward to the cutting edge research that will be featured. Thank you very much. Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor David Tennant, Head of the Department of Economics, Dr. Nadine McLeod Rose, our keynote speaker, Professor Jeffrey Wooldridge, conference attendees, good morning. It is my absolute joy, honor, and privilege to introduce this morning our keynote speaker, Professor Jeffrey M. Wooldridge. When I sat down to think about what I was gonna say, I decided to check his CV online to give me some material to talk about. When I downloaded his CV, it was 23 pages. So as you can see, I have quite a challenge this morning to be able to condense all of his accomplishments into five minutes. And my second challenge is also going to be to convey that apart from all his academic and scholarly achievements, he is also quite an affable, good-natured, gracious, generous, and humble person. So I want to get all of that across to you guys this morning. OK, so here goes. Our keynote speaker is a university distinguished professor of economics at Michigan State University. He is also the co-director of the Economics of Education Specialization at MSU. Professor Wooldridge received a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. He then went on to earn a PhD in economics from the University of California, San Diego. After leaving California, he was an assistant professor at MIT from 1986 to 1991. He moved from Massachusetts to Michigan, where he is now a distinguished university professor. He is currently an associate editor for the Stato Journal and has served as associate editor for the Journal of Econometrics and the Review of Economics and Statistics. He has also served as associate editor as well as editor for the Journal of Business and Economic Statistics 
and he has served as co-editor for Econometric Theory and Economics Letters. He is a past president of the Midwest Economics Association. He has received several awards and fellowships, including the Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship and the, Econo and the Econometric Theory Plural Scripsit Award. He is an occasional consultant for the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, Deloitte Consulting, Stratus Consulting, and Industrial Economics, Inc. He has over 60 published articles. And as our students well know, he is the author of Introductory Econometrics and Econometric Analysis of Cross-Sectional and Panel Data, as well as chapters in several books. But of all his distinctions, my very favorite is the fact that he received the Teacher of the Year Award from the MIT Graduate Economics Association on three different occasions. But in my book, he's Teacher and Advisor of the Year every year. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our keynote speaker, Professor Jeffrey M. Wooldridge. Well, Patrice, thank you very much for that introduction. I think this is a new thing for me. I think this is the first time a former student of mine has introduced me for a talk, actually. So, well, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to talk about um, a topic which, so I'll, I'll slightly apologize. It's somewhat specialized, but it, um, it does reflect, I think, in some circles, a move towards um, experiments, running experiments to try to you know, do policy intervention and, um, in various fields, including development economics and education. And in some ways, it's, um, it's a paper that uh, I, it's joint work with a current student of mine, Akanksha Negi. And it's a, one of these papers where it's fairly easy and you get clean results, and I think they're somewhat useful. So, even if you don't deal with experimental data, hopefully I'll have something that you can take away from this um, because it does have to do with some of my earlier work. Okay, so the, um, the, there's the outline of the talk. I'll try to keep it within the allotted time. I know coffee breaks are quite important, I know, at conferences. So, um, so this, uh, like I said, this is a fairly simple idea. Um, if you think about having the simplest case where you have a control group and a treatment group, and you're trying to study some intervention, like maybe assigning students to a small class versus a large class, or um, um, some assigning people to a job training program. These people participate, these people don't. And the idea is you actually randomize it, okay? So this still isn't terribly common in what we do. We often have to deal with, deal with retrospective data, but still there are cases where random assignment is being used more and more. So, um, you know, in some ways, you can, you know, we know what works in this case in the sense of getting both unbiased and consistent estimators, and that is to just use what I will refer to as the simple difference in means estimator, which means you just compute the average for the control group and for the treatment group, and you take the difference, and that's an unbiased estimator of the, of the treatment effect, of the average treatment effect. And it doesn't matter if the treatment effects are different across different units. Because of the randomization, you're going to get an unbiased and consistent estimator of the so-called average effect. In fact, one could argue that this is the first useful thing um, that one learns in statistics is to you know, do an intervention and you actually then estimate the effect by just computing the, sim the, the, the difference in means. Now, the reason one might go beyond that is because Sometimes these experiments don't have a lot of data. Sometimes the effects you're trying to detect can be somewhat small. And so um, we might want to try to improve on it in terms of precision. Okay, so it's not necessarily true that just using the difference in means is going to be the best we can do. And in fact, not surprisingly, if we have some covariates or predictors of the outcome, we in general can possibly improve the efficiency of the estimator, which means, of course, as a practical matter, shrinking our standard error and shrinking the width of our confidence interval. And this isn't, um, you know, this, we probably, I think most of us here are thinking about 
policy interventions, but you know, even in industry, they're interested in these sorts of things like at, at large companies like Amazon and Google and so on, where you know, they are interested in trying to figure out how people behave when you change a little something. Okay, so, uh, so that's going to be the topic. So the, the, the downside to regression adjustment, okay, and regression adjustment is really a fancy name for doing ordinary least squares, or if we hopefully uh, get to it, I'll talk about some nonlinear regression adjustments briefly. Um, and so the, the one drawback is that, in general, these are not unbiased, okay? So the conditions under which you would argue for unbiasedness, you, can't, you don't want to assume they hold because then you're cheating, okay? So the whole game here is to try to argue that you can get an improvement over the simple difference in mean estimator without making extra assumptions. If you make extra assumptions, like I said, that's cheating, right? Because then you should be able to do better. If you assume something, you should get something for it. So the idea here is to try to figure out whether you can get improvements without making more assumptions. Now, the problem then is that the improvements are going to be in terms of asymptotics, okay? So you can't in general say that the estimator, the regression adjustment estimators are unbiased. In some cases they will be, but we don't want to rely on that, okay? So um, we're going to argue that it's sensible to look at large sample or asymptotic theory in order to claim that we get an improvement over just doing the simple difference in means, okay? So, I won't apologize anymore about, you know, the fact that these estimators might have some bias. I will show you some simulations that show that they seem to do pretty well even if you don't have a large sample size. And by the way, you might say, what is new in this paper? Because this is something that people do. So what's new is that we have some new efficiency results on the kind of sampling scheme that you might confront in, in your own work. Okay, so. The, the kinds of, the, the distinctions we have to make are, first of all, are we going to do just a linear regression adjustment or might we use something nonlinear? So why might you use something nonlinear? Well, maybe the response variable is binary. Does the person get a job or not after a job training program? As we're going to show, you can do linear regression. It doesn't cause any bias or anything like that. It, it doesn't, we still are going to get consistent estimates. We're going to improve over not doing anything in general, but we may be able to improve even more if we take the binary nature of the y variable, the outcome variable, seriously. So in other words, we go to a nonlinear model in this literature for the same reasons we do just generally when we do probit and logit and Poisson regression and so on. Okay, and then there's an important distinction between what we call pooled regression adjustment versus what we'll call full or separate. Okay, maybe, maybe separate is actually a better descriptor. In other words, are we going to just add the covariates, the, the predictors, to a, to a simple regression, or are we actually going to do two separate regressions um, on the control and on the treatment group? This turns out to matter, at least in theory, okay? Um, and so this final bullet point is that not all combinations are theoretically desirable. So to kind of give away some of the conclusions, while you should use logit, you shouldn't use probit. While you should use Poisson regression, you shouldn't use negative binomial regression. Okay, now for those of you who think that that sounds weird, I'm going to try to convince you of that, okay, as to why that, that these combinations are important to use. Okay, so, um, so the, the overview, the, the, most of the paper uh, that this is based on is um, based on linear regression adjustment because there we have the cleanest set of results. Um, so it matters a lot whether the treatment effect is constant for every unit in the population. So in other words, think of there being a population and we're going to draw a random sample from that population. And then random sampling, of course, is separate from how the assignment to the control and the treatment is done. We're going to assume random assignment as well, okay? So the, the literature clearly has focused on this case. Um, and, but what I'm going to, to hopefully convince you of, especially via simulations, is that the nonlinear methods, if you're careful, are just as robust as the linear methods and can produce quite, lower, quite a bit lower standard errors in some cases, okay? Okay, so in the constant treatment effect case, the uh, pooled regression adjustment is consistent and it has a smaller asymptotic variance, and so uh, I'm not going to focus on this. Um, this is actually known. There are, um, there's a, a paper that's not too old by Winston Lin. But um, the, um, 
he does, he's primarily a statistician and he studies this problem in the context of knowing the entire population so there's no sampling error. For us, that's a little, that, that's not entire, you know, that's not very desirable because usually we have a population in mind that we might want to impose the, the treatment on at some point and we just take a random sample. In this nice book by Imbens and Rubin, they actually cover the random sampling case. So in, in some ways, we're filling in a gap that's in this Imbens and Rubin book. Okay, so in the heterogeneous treatment effect case, this is the one I'm going to focus on. This is the case that everybody's interested, right, is that it, it could be that people, say, with good labor market histories benefit differently from a job training program than people with poor labor market histories, or maybe it varies by the lo level of education, or maybe it varies by things we can't even measure or observe. So the, the reason the literature on treatment effects, I think, has been ongoing and, and widespread is because we're really interested in this issue where the units, I'll just say people, you know, react differently to the intervention, benefit differently from the intervention. Okay, so the interesting thing about this is uh, so in this paper by Lynn, uh, he shows that the pooled regression adjustment actually may be worse than doing nothing. Okay, so that's actually a really interesting finding, and I'll, I'll show you some simulations where you can actually see that. And um, the, but in, on the other hand, the full regression adjustment is better than both, or I should be more careful, it's no worse than both. Okay, there are cases where it's not strictly better, but you never do worse, okay? Again, um, he uses this finite sample setting, which ignores one important feature of the problem, okay? So Imbens and Rubin partly fill it in, okay? They get the same results. However, I just want to point here is they ignore the sampling variation in the covariates, okay? So um, the idea is this. You randomly sample from the population. You observe whether somebody's in the control or the treatment, right? That's a zero, one variable. You observe their outcome. Maybe it's, you know, labor market earnings after the program. And then you observe some covariates, which may be your labor market earnings before the program, okay? And if you're going to be fair about this, you have to account for the fact that the X bar is an estimate of the population mean, right? The whole point is you're sampling from a subset of the population, therefore there's sampling variation in X bar. So the, the first contribution of this paper whose results I'm summarizing is that we show that in fact, after accounting for the sampling variation in X bar, in other words, doing what we do most of the time, you know, we collect random samples from populations, uh, is that the full regression adjustment is still the most asymptotically efficient estimator and we characterize when there's actually no gain from doing that versus the simple method or that the pooled method is sufficient for capturing all of the efficiency gains. Okay, so let me just, um, if you, I, I'm sure most of you have seen this, this setting. If not, it's, a, you know, the potential outcomes is kind of a good way to think about these, um, these issues. So the, the, there's a binary treatment, um, I'm calling it W, so this is the thing that is going to, to determine the control of the treatment group. There are potential outcomes where the idea here is that you can think of each unit in the population as being in both states of the world. So you can think of the same person participating in a job training program or not. And so you want to think of your population accordingly, right? You don't want to make it too big. Um, you want it to be, you know, kind of sensible as to who could actually participate in the job training program. And then what we're, we're the, uh, as has been pointed out by many, is that this problem of trying to estimate the, the, the average treatment effect is like a missing data problem. We only observe people in one state of the world, right? So we observe either their outcome in the control state or in the treatment state, but we don't observe both. And then, um, you know, so then the observed outcome, which we're going to call Y, can be written in this simple way where it just picks off Y0 or Y1 depending on whether the unit is in the control or the treatment group. And so, so far, the data we observe is W, which is just the 0, 1 variable, and then Y is just whatever the outcome is. And, and I'm not putting any restrictions on why. It could be discrete, binary, it could be continuous, it could be some mixture, so there's no restriction on the nature of why. Okay, okay. 
And then we're going to assume that we actually have some observed predictors of y. So I call these covariates. But what you really want these to be is you want these to be good predictors of the outcome. So if y is something like post-training labor market earnings, then the x's could include socioeconomic variables, you know, past labor market outcomes that we think would predict future labor market outcomes. Now remember, if we have random assignment like this, so random assignment is formally stated as W is independent, not just of the potential outcomes, but of the covariates as well. So in other words, we're not even using their previous labor market history to determine whether in the, they're in the control of the treatment group. We're, we're basically flipping a biased coin, okay? And then it comes up heads, they're in the treatment group. It comes up tails, they're in the control group, okay? So that's the setup. And then the random, this is the random sampling assumption where we have independent and identically distributed draws. There are some interesting questions about whether these results that I'm going to tell you extend to other kinds of sampling schemes, um, the answer is I don't know. Okay, so if you had cluster sampling or stratified sampling, my hunch is they do, but you know, hunches can be wrong. <laughs> Believe me, hunches can be wrong. Okay, uh, so, uh, so the, the so-called linear regression adjustment. So I wanna make sure we understand something here. Um, when I write down a linear equation, I'm not assuming that it's correctly specified in any sense. So for those of you who are familiar with my introductory econometrics book, it starts off with multiple regression by saying the conditional mean of the error term given the x's is zero. Okay, and what does that imply? It means that the mean of y given x is linear in those x's. Okay, we don't want to assume that here because we don't, that's, that's making extra assumptions. Okay, for those of you who are familiar with my graduate level book, you might remember early in the chapters I talk about the notion of a linear projection, which is definitional. You can always define it. You can always take any outcome variable y and regress it on any set of x's in a linear way. That identifies what we call the linear projection. There's no sense in which that's a true model. It's simply the best fitting linear function of the x's. That's the setup that we want to use here so that we're not adding on any extra assumptions. Okay, so what we're interested in is these two parameters, which is the mean outcome in the control state over the whole population. The mu one is the mean outcome in the treated state over the whole population. Again, remember there's this counterfactual thought going on here. And then we're interested in particular in the difference between them. This is the so-called average treatment effect. Some people prefer to call it the average causal effect. Okay, it's just looking at the difference between the two potential outcomes for every unit in the population and then averaging, okay? So whether Y is discrete or continuous, we know how to do that averaging. Okay, so um, the, the case of heterogeneous treatment effects, which is the one that I'm, I'm going to focus on, we can always rewrite each of these potential outcomes in terms of their means plus a random variable, which I'm calling V0 in the first case and V1 in the second case. These are, by definition, random variables that have a zero mean, okay, because we've taken out the mean of y0 and y1 already. So all we know about v0 and v1 so far is that they have a zero mean. I'm going to assume they have a finite variance, okay? If they don't, then we know regression doesn't work well in that case. So n none of these kind of technical, um, uh, technical issues are, are going to play a role here. I, I want to be able to use the law of large numbers in the central limit theorem without saying anything further about it. Okay, so um, the treatment effect for unit I, so now let's think about drawing somebody randomly from the population and putting an I subscript on that. The difference, the treatment effect, of course, is the overall population treatment effect. And then you can think of this VI1 minus VI0 as the individual specific contribution to the treatment effect. So we've taken out the, um, the overall mean effect and that's the thing we're interested in, however, we want to make sure we allow for this effect to be different across individuals in the population. If we didn't, if we set V0, VI1, and, and VI0 equal to each other for every I, then that would be the constant treatment effect case, okay? And that's, that's too restrictive. Okay, so um, just a little more notation here. The X with one dot over it, it denotes if we could observe the population mean of the X's, then we are deviating the X's from their mean. Okay, 
By the way, in case this slipped by you, x here is a row vector. Okay, so just to why why there's no transpose showing up here is because I always define this to be a row vector. So this is what we would do if we could observe the population mean of the x's. Okay, and we'll come back to what happens when we can't do that. Okay, momentarily. So here's where this notion of a linear projection becomes important. I can always definitionally write this. Okay, so first of all, we can write v0 projecting it on these x's. That automatically gives us a new error term, and that error term has certain, certain um, properties that I'll mention in a moment. Uh, and then when we plug in for v0 and v1, this means that we've written the two potential outcomes as just two linear functions. Okay, now, from kind of basic mechanics of least squares, what I've done here is I've deviated the x's from their means, and so the intercept in these two equations is what we're trying to estimate. It's the mean value of y0 here and the mean value of y1 there. Okay? So the question is, we know how to estimate those by just using the sample averages under random assignment, but we're going to use these linear regression equations to try to do better. Okay? So this is what happens when we plug in the observed value. And so what I want to point out here are a couple of things. So this is, um, so th you know, eventually we're going to take the observed y and we're going to regress on something and, and what are we going to do? Well, one way to think about this is this is a regression model with a full set of interactions. Okay, so notice we have the intercept. We have the, um, the x's deviated with the slopes in the control case. We have that error term. And then the key here is that the coefficient, so I, I'm not you know, going through the algebra in any detail here. It's pretty easy. But the coefficient on the treatment indicator is the average treatment effect. Okay? And then what we have here is we have a commonly used device as we interact the treatment with the x's. Okay, so we have basically a model. We've expressed it in terms of interaction effects. And this is like just having two separate regression models, one for the control group, one for the treatment group. Okay? And so this is the, so the question is, how do we know that estimating this equation is going to be better than just doing the simple regression adjustment? Okay, well, and here's the, the point. Um, we don't want to assume anything about what the true conditional mean functions are. You can always do this whether, so this is one of those cases where if you have an outcome which is a zero one outcome and you do a linear regression and somebody says, oh, why are you doing that? Everybody knows you shouldn't do a linear regression with a binary outcome. Well, this is actually a case where you actually should do linear regression. It's not the only thing you can do, but it's perfectly good to do this, okay? And, and we'll see why. Okay, so here are the four different estimators and then I'm gonna show you what the, what the results are. Okay, so, oops, one is the, the simple difference in means. So Y1 bar is just to take the treatment and average. Y0 is to take the control group and average and just form the difference. Okay. What we call pooled regression adjustment is to regress Y on the treatment indicator and the X's. By the way, I should have reminded you that this estimator, Y1 bar minus Y10, it can be gotten from this regression if you just drop the X's. Okay. So if you regress y on a constant and the treatment indicator, the coefficient on w is just the simple difference in means. Okay, so, that, so what we're doing is we're taking essentially the simple regression and we're adding x's to turn it into a multiple regression. Okay, that's basically what's happening in that estimator. Okay, so full regression adjustment, you can characterize it two different ways. Um, one is to just you know, actually do the regression separately for the control group and for the treatment group you get the intercepts, uh, which are indexed by zero and one, and then the full regression adjustment treatment effect is estimated like this, and you'll notice that X bar is there because realistically, we're going to use the sample average to estimate that population, the vector of population means. Uh, it is the same as the coefficient on WI down here, where we include all of those interaction terms, okay? Now, if you do it like this, I'm going to suggest you don't do it like this, that there's, if you're, well, I, I'm always thinking in, in stata mode probably too much, but there's a stata command actually that does this the right way and, and computes the proper standard error, which is the most important thing. Okay, but 
if you do this by hand, it's critical to make sure you demean the x's before creating the interaction term. Okay? That forces the coefficient on wi to be the average treatment effect. If you don't do that, you're going to estimate a very weird treatment effect, which is when all the x's are zero, which is not interesting, virtually never is an interesting part of the population. Okay? So anyway, um, and then there's this estimator which we call the infeasible regression adjustment, and it's infeasible from our perspective because it puts in the population means rather than the sample averages. So this is included just to confirm what you think should be true, is that this should be more efficient than this estimator because when you plug in the known value here, there's no sampling error that you have to account for. Okay, so the first three are the interesting ones. Those are computable from the data. The fourth one is what would happen if you had actually the, the, the population means. Okay, so here's the theorem. And you know what, um, since we're you know, running a bit short on time, so, so I'm going to point to four formulas, okay? And these are four asymptotic variances. And they depend on two things. Um, I think I didn't even define this yet, so I should. So rho here, that's the probability of being in the treatment group, okay? Therefore, one minus rho is the probability of being in the control group. So if you're flipping a fair coin, this is, this is a half, okay? So each, one, each of these is a half. But, you know, in many cases, the control group might be quite a bit bigger than the treatment group, for example. And so rho can be anything strictly between zero and one, okay? Omega x is the variance covariance matrix of the x's. And then the sigma squared w, where w is 0, 1, this is the error variance of, the, of these linear projected error terms. Okay, so, um, so the most interesting thing is the comparison across the formulas, not necessarily the formulas themselves. So there's a formula for the simple difference in means. There's a formula for the pooled regression adjustment, and, um, and actually, um, it's, it's kind of the, the interesting comparison is in some ways between these two, although also between this first one and the second one. Um, this is the full regression adjustment. And I have to say when we first derived this, I thought there wasn't you know, a useful result here until you look at these two formulas and see that they're the same except for this is an extra term in the pooled regression adjustment. And if you're better at math than I am, maybe you can, in your mind, picture that function, which is minimized at um, rho equals a half, and that's when it's one, and from there it increases. And so this factor is always bigger than or equal to one, and if you compare it with the full regression adjustment, that's the proof that doing the regression separately is never any worse than doing them, uh, than, than doing the pooled regression. And then this down here, you can see it omits this first term because this is the first term that, that is caused by having to estimate the average. And so clearly, just from this formula, if you plotted this function, you would see that this one is the, is the smallest, this one is the, in the middle, and this one is the largest, although there are cases where these two things are the same. In fact, I'll just summarize because you can see it also matters whether beta zero and beta one are the same. If they're the same, those first terms go away and all three estimators have exactly the same asymptotic variance. And it's also the same as this, sorry, that's not true here. This one though will still have this extra term even if beta one and beta zero are, um, are different from each other, sorry, are the same. Doesn't matter whether they're the same or different. Okay, so this is the most efficient. I'm just going to say that, but it's infeasible, so we don't care. This is the function I was talking about. Um, to tell you the truth, I just had to graph this to see that I didn't, you know, my calculus is. So anyway, you can probably, if you graph this, you'll see that it minimizes at, at a half. Um, and, so the, the pooled reg and so the pooled regression adjustment, interestingly, there are two cases where it is asymptotically as efficient as the, um, feasible, as the feasible one. And one is pretty obvious, that is, if there's no difference in the slopes, then you don't have to estimate two separate slopes, and so you get full efficiency by pooling. Okay, so if that weren't true, that would be weird, right? So if these two sets of slopes are the same, why should you have to estimate two, two separate slopes? The interesting thing is, though, there's no gain in imposing that restriction. So in other words, 
the full regression adjustment does not suffer even if this condition is true. So because this is a pretty strong condition, you probably don't want to impose it. The other case is caught us more by surprise, and that is in the 50-50 assignment, there's no gain in doing the separate reg regression either. And so, in other words, if the assignment is a coin flip, uh, you know, of a fair coin, then the pooled regression gets you the full asymptotically efficient than doing the separate ones. So the reason to do the separate ones are you don't have 50-50 assignment and you think that there's heterogeneity. You should know whether two is true or not because you're supposedly controlling the randomization, right? But you, you would never know whether one was true unless you, you, know, you can do testing and so on, but it's probably not worth it. Okay, so um, the fourth result is, okay, so this is a linear algebra result, but you this is the thing that's not obvious from the formulas, and that is that you can always show that the difference in the simple difference in means variance and the full regression adjustment is always positive semi, is always positive, and that uses a result on positive semi-definite matrices, which I clearly don't have time to go in into. Um, and so it, it turns out the only way that you're going to not do better by doing regression adjustment as a practical case, and that is if you, if you chose lousy predictors, okay? So if the X's don't actually predict Y, then there's no reason to do regression adjustment, right? So this is all predicated on you actually have chosen some good predictors of Y, otherwise you're wasting your time doing regression adjustment. So this, um, the, you know, there are other cases where it could happen. They seem quite unrealistic. The only case that seems realistic is when the X's just don't predict, okay? By the way, just to give you a little intuition as to where the efficiency gain comes from, at least this kind of works for me. This isn't a proof, but it sort of works, is you can show that the full regression adjustment estimate of the mean is to just plug in X bar, which is taken over the entire sample. Okay, so X bar is averaged across the control and the treatment. By simple OLS mechanics, you can show that the, the sample average on just the treated group can be written in the same way, but there's a big difference. There's, an, there's a one subscript on X bar, okay? That means that the X's are only averaged over the treated group, okay? Now, these are both unbiased and consistent estimators of the population mean, but X bar uses the full sample, and X1 bar only uses a subsample, so this one's throwing away data, okay? And so that's why doing the full regression adjustment is more efficient. It uses all of the data we have on the X's to estimate the population mean, whereas this one only uses the X's for the treated group. Okay, so that's one way you can kind of figure out why the regression adjustment works. And then finally, this is kind of interesting, is that this was the result I was talking about. The pooled method might actually be less efficient than doing nothing. Okay, so if, you, if the setup is right, adding the X's can actually increase the variance rather than decrease it or even leave it the same. Okay, so. The, the bottom line is, unless you have a really small sample and you're worried about, you know, small sample problems, it's better to do the full regression adjustment. There's no cost in doing it, and the efficiency gains, the theory tells us that in most cases we are going to get some sort of efficiency gain, okay? Okay, so here's what I was saying. So for those of you who are Stata users, there's a built-in command that does this, so, um, and the the, the nice thing about this is that um, it properly computes the standard error. So what you do is you just choose RA, this stands for regression adjustment, and you do this, um, you put in whatever X's you want. You can do the usual things, interactions of X's, squares, and so on. And then you choose, this is how you choose the treatment variable. You just put whatever the treatment variable is in parentheses. Now, usually you use this because you're trying to account for non-random assignment. That is, you think the assignment mechanism depends on the X's, okay? So that's what regression adjustment is often used for, is to control for these factors because you think that W has been assigned non-randomly. Here, we're using it under random assignment to improve efficiency, okay? So that it's the same command, it's the same calculations, it's just it's being used for a different um, a different purpose. Okay, there are other ways to do that too. Okay, so I'm going to show you some um, simulation results. 
Um, and the, so, so remember, we're trying to be fair here because I, I, I like to think I'm not particularly dogmatic in econometrics. Whatever is you know, relatively easy and works, I'm all for. So I don't want to rig the simulations, actually, I should say. Akanksha didn't want to rig the simulations um, so that we, we knew that we were going to do better. Okay? And what I mean by that is we intentionally misspecify the model to show you that you get efficiency gains even if you have the wrong model. Okay, so what I mean by this is, so in the first case, the, the true conditional mean function, okay, so remember I said we're not assuming we have the conditional mean right, but the true function is a quadratic in the two variables x1 and x2, okay? And actually there are some where we put x1, to, sorry, x2 to be a binary variable, in which case the squaring would be irrelevant. But we're not going to use the nonlinear terms. When we do the regression adjustment, we're only going to include the linear terms x1 and x2. Okay. In the second experiment, we're actually going to make this a probit function, and we're only going to again use the we're only going to use linear regression. Okay. So make make sure you understand. There's no nonlinear estimation here whatsoever. This is linear regression. The true model is just generated to be misspecified in two different ways, okay? So in other words, this is a binary response, but we're just doing a linear probability model. So we're making two misspecifications. We're using a linear model and we're dropping the nonlinear terms in X1 and X2 as well, okay? And then um, for anyone who's interested in the paper, I'm happy to send it. We just actually revised this. Um, and um, so there is this notion of mild heterogeneity versus strong, and it has to do with whether these mean functions are very different across the, the treatment and the control outcome. Okay, so, uh, so the first one, it, the first two are the, the mean is actually linear, but we, we forget to put in these two, uh, the, the three quadratic and uh, interaction terms, and then mild strong, mild strong heterogeneity. And what we're going to expect is to get bigger gains when there's more heterogeneity because that's when the doing the separate regression adjustment should be most valuable. Okay, so hopefully you can see those numbers. So this is um, 200 total observations. Okay, so you might think of this as being kind of a small experiment. Only 10% roughly of the units are treated. Okay, so you basically flip a biased coin that has a probability 0.1 coming up heads. If it comes up heads, the person's in the treated group. So what you would expect, you would expect 20 units in the treated and 180 in the control. Okay? Of course, it's not going to be quite like that, but th that's what would happen on average. And so then we go up to the 50-50 case. In the paper, we have the 0.9 case, but the slide was getting too wide, so I just cut it at 0.7. Okay, so, so, this is, so you can see that the simple difference in means does have a very small bias. Um, the pooled regression adjustment has a bit bigger bias. By the way, the true treatment effect here is one, okay? So you can think of these as percentages of bias, okay? Um, the um, full regression adjustment has a bit more bias of the, of, the, of the other way. I'm gonna ignore this last line. Interestingly, knowing the mean of X does not help with the bias. Um, in fact, it's, uh, it's the most biased of the estimators. So these, the first three are the three feasible ones, okay? So there's bias, and then there's the sampling standard deviation. <clears throat> and so this one simulation shows that you can actually be worse off by just adding these two covariates in the pooled regression because the standard deviation from the pooled is about 1.6 compared with about 1.25. So this is more efficient the, than, do, than adding the covariates. On the other hand, the theory tells us that if we do the separate regressions, even though we've misspecified them, we should do no worse. And we know we're going to do better because the X's do help to predict the outcome, and this is not one of those 50-50 cases. So in other words, you can see the full regression adjustment. Not only is it a lot better than the pooled regression adjustment, but it is actually better than doing nothing as well. Okay, so this is kind of the fall in the standard error that you would expect, you know, in, a, in kind of a typical random sample. And not surprisingly, knowing the mean, of course, we know that that does the best in terms of standard deviation, but we can't, it's infeasible anyway. Okay, moving across here, the theory tells us that in the 0.5 case, 
there shouldn't be any efficiency gain from doing separate versus pooled, and you can see that comes out pretty much you know, in the simulation. So the standard deviations are virtually identical. You know, there's always simulation error, of course. Um, the biases are still there a bit, but remember, this is just with 200 observations in total. And then again, as we go up to where there's a 70% chance of being treated, again, um, the theory is, is borne out here. In fact, in this case, for some reason, the bias is actually smallest in the full regression adjustment. But you know, simulations are always special. Here's a case with more heterogeneity. And you can see that um, you can see that more heterogeneity makes the pooled method even worse. Okay. It, it's the, the separate regression adjustment is doing better than both, as the theory says, until you know, we get over here and then um, again, subject to the kind of simulation error when there's a 50-50 treatment, we don't get any benefit from doing the separate regression adjustment. Okay, so um, I'm going to, so here's what happens with the, so now there's a binary outcome, but we're doing the same exact same linear regression ad adjustment. And here, um, so you can see the, uh, by the way, I think in this case, the treatment effect is 0.075 to make it kind of a realistic probability change. Okay. And so you can see the bias is pretty small for all of these. And again, the theory is pretty much borne out, although it's true the efficiency gains from doing the, 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 the separate versus the pool certainly are more modest here. We know that there is no gain again in the case of a half. And so you know, together, if you were to look across all of these, you'd see that you know, it really is the full regression adjustment that is kind of doing quite a bit better. Now, since I created these slides, we actually did compute the root mean squared error, right, which accounts for the bias and the variance. And again, the ranking of the estimators is still essentially the same. So I won't go, not surprisingly, um, as you increase the number of observations, the bias in these methods drops. And so in fact, um, you know, the bias is comparable to just the simple difference in means. And this is the consistency of the estimator kicking in, even though technically it's not unbiased. Okay. So uh, I won't bore you with that. You can go through and see that everything is pretty much the same. Okay. So um, I will um, try to keep us on track. Okay. And I'll, I'm just going to tell you about the nonlinear regression adjustment and, and what the bottom line is. And then, then, uh, Finish. Okay, so, um, so I want to make sure we understand that you don't have to do this. Okay, that is, if you have good predictors of y, and what you're trying to do is, you know, shrink your confidence intervals a bit, then um, you can just stick with the linear regression adjustment. Okay, the theory is the theory. You don't need anyth anything further. However, it does make sense to think: Is it possible? that if y is a binary outcome, might we be able to do even better by using a binary response model, like a logit or a probit or complementary log log or some, something that's a bit more exotic than that? And the answer is, it looks like it, but I have to admit, we don't have a proof yet, okay? And I'm not sure one is forthcoming, um, just because, well, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe there will be some insight that Akansha or I has, but so, um, so we basically, this part of the paper, the idea, the, the goal is more modest. And that is to make sure that by doing a nonlinear model, you're not doing any harm. Okay, and not doing any harm means you're not introducing inconsistency uh, in the estimates. Okay, and this leads to something which is actually related to some previous work I'd done um, in uh, 2007, six, something like that on nonlinear regression adjustment. Um, and the, I'm, I'm putting this, I could put the quote up by Imbens and Rubin, probably I should. Um, wanted to scale the criticism back a little bit. Imbens is my sometimes co-author, so, you know. <laughs> but they have this uh, discussion in their new book that basically says, well, since a nonlinear model would impose extra restrictions, you shouldn't do nonlinear regression adjustment because it's unfair to impose those restrictions if there's a danger of inconsistency. 
So we thought about this a while, and then, aha, um, this is related to some previous work I'd done on so-called uh, doubly robust estimators, which combines regression adjustment with inverse probability weighting. Okay, so for those of you who know what probability, you know what the propensity score is, where you estimate the probability of treatment as a, a function of the x's. Well, here, we know that's constant because w is assigned independently of the x's, right? So it turns out those results applied immediately to this case, um, but you have to be careful, okay? So it's true that if you do just a probit and you say, well, you know, economists use probit a lot, I'm going to do that, it could be that you're introducing inconsistency because the probit functional form doesn't have the right property for robustness, whereas the logit functional form does. This is one of those things where we usually don't think there's much of a difference between probit and logit. In this case, there's a, a very big practical difference, okay? So, as it turns out, in this paper, if I, I guess it, I forgot to reference it, it's, I believe, the Journal of Econometrics 2007. Um, I basically characterize the combinations of, so I want to, this is a good, good point to remind you that there's a difference between a model and an estimation method, right? So the model is what we're going to assume the conditional mean function is nominally, and then the estimation method is something like nonlinearly squares or maximum likelihood or quasi-maximum likelihood. So as it turns out, there are only a certain combinations of models and estimation methods that deliver this robustness result. Okay, so here are the ones. You can, you can group the binary case and the fractional response case into the same one because you use exactly the same estimation method. Um, you have to choose a logistic mean function and you have to use the usual logistic logit uh, log likelihood function. So in other words, Using probit doesn't work here. Using logit with nonlinearly squares doesn't work. You have to combine the logit function with the so-called Bernoulli quasi-likelihood. In other words, you just do logit, and it doesn't matter whether y is fractional or not, that estimator is going to be consistent, okay? That's, of course, that to me is the leading case because we often see variables that are zero, one, and we're seeing a lot more that are fractions between zero and one. So this is how, so what, what full regression adjustment is going to do is you actually separately do a logit for the control and the logit for the treatment. You could do a pooled method, but I'm not, you know, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to cover that here, but you could do a pooled method. But the full regression adjustment estimates the parameters using the control group, using the treatment, but then it averages the fitted values across all observations, okay? so. This is the average, again, across all units once we estimated these, these coefficients. And then the, the treatment effects estimator is just the difference in these two estimated means, okay? This is how you actually get stated to do this if you're interested. So if, and f, you know, for better or worse, stata actually distinguishes between the binary case and the fractional case but this is doing exactly the same thing numerically. It's just that if you try to do this with a fraction, Stata will change your data on you. Okay, so don't, don't do that. This is fractional logit is what that stands for. So you do this in T effects and you get the answer. Okay, so this is a one line thing that you can do. If Y is non negative, so, and then I'm, I'm gonna just show you briefly some simulations and then, and then stop, um, and I know Whenever I talk about Poisson regression, it's inevitable that at least a couple of people from the audience will come up afterwards and say, well, I learned that Poisson regression is no good because everybody knows the Poisson distribution is too restrictive and so on. My, my advisor says to use negative binomial, okay? I plead with you, don't do that, okay? <laughs> After, because I'm going to tell you, I don't have time to prove this to you, okay? There is only one estimator to use here and it's Poisson regression, and it doesn't matter if y is even a count variable. Any non-negative variable, it could be continuous. It could be like a tobit piled up at zero, but a continuous outcome, okay? I don't care that it doesn't have a Poisson distribution, right? Obviously, it can't in those cases, but the, the exponential mean function 
combined with the Poisson quasi likelihood function. The Poisson distribution is in the linear exponential family. That's where this robustness result comes from, combined with the fact that the exponential mean function corresponds to what's known as the canonical link. So for those of you who know the generalized linear models literature, there's this terminology here, okay. In any case, you can show this is the only combination that works in terms of consistency for um, the combination. Now, if I know something follows a Tobit model, okay, that's going to work too, but see, I don't want to cheat like that. Then you've added a ton of assumptions, right, to get to the Tobit model. This works no matter what. Okay, so that's the idea. So, so here's the, the, the reference, and it does follow immediately from this work I did on so-called doubly robust estimators. This stands for inverse probability weighting regression adjustment estimators, and that's actually what Stata calls them as well. Unfortunately, we can't prove that this is, or so far, that this actually leads to efficiency gains. In the linear case, I showed you what the theorem was. In the nonlinear case, it's tantalizingly close, it seems, but not quite there. However, I'll, I'll show you with some simulations what happens. So again, in this case, we don't want to cheat. So we generated the data to be fractional probit, but we're, we can't use probit in estimation because that's cheating. So we're going to use the logit, fractional logit, and um, we're going to ignore the quadratic function again. So again, there's, there's this two sources of misspecification, okay? And the, the theory says that we have that we're still going to consistently estimate the average treatment effect doing this, okay? It's like, it's like a free lunch. You can do anything as long as you use logit, you can include any x's you want, okay? Okay, so here's what happens. So again, this is a pretty small sample size to be doing a nonlinear estimation method, right? This is, and I didn't show you the point 0.1. It's a little worse than this, but it's not completely terrible. But so here's, so remember, so this is pooled regression adjustment. This is linear regression adjustment, which is still consistent, okay? And this is what happens when you do the logit fractional response, okay? So you use that F logit option in Stata. You can see that it, it actually has the smallest bias, even though it's a nonlinear estimation method. And it certainly has by far the lowest standard deviation. So this, and, and you still, you can see what happens in the 50-50 assignment case too is, as the theory says, the linear pooled and the linear separate are going to have the same asymptotic efficiency, but the nonlinear separate is actually giving you quite a, quite a big drop in the standard deviation. If you want to be convinced of this, imagine what your confidence interval would be, okay, using a 0 0.035 versus a 0 0.02. I mean, it's not, you know, like this is <laughs> overwhelming, but it's not trivial, right, when you're trying to shrink your standard errors. And compared with doing nothing, this is less than half, okay? So you've actually shrunk, legitimately shrunk your standard error by more than a half, okay? So the rest of this is, um, here's the, the case where the outcome is non-negative and I intentionally made it a mixture of a discrete and a continuous variable. So I'll just again show you one thing here is these are the two linear cases. This is what happens when you do Poisson regression Again, we didn't, we didn't rig this. This actually has the smallest bias in terms of being a lot more efficient than any of the other estimators I talked about. So I'll leave you with this. Um, <laughs> um, it'd be nice if we could prove efficiency in this case, but um, so far that's been a bit elusive. And um, the, the summary is there are more slides, but I know we need to get to our coffee break. So. Um, the summary is um, the linear regression adjustment is fine, okay, and it is used. Um, but here we basically, so in, in some ways, the, the contribution there is to show that when you adjust for the sampling error in the x's, you still get the efficiency gain. Um, the, I think the really interesting stuff, though, is what happens when you have some sort of discrete or limited outcome. These simulations are strongly suggestive that this can actually be a good thing to do, and it's for free, because as long as you believe me in which combinations to use based on the nature of why, you're not going to introduce any inconsistency, and, these, and numbers like these seem to show that you, know, you can do substantially better in terms of efficiency. Okay, so I sh thank you, and I should at least allow for a question or two, I think.
and I'm happy to talk about this. Yeah. Yes, Nadine. That's what slides 44 through 50 something. <laughs> Sorry, I know we have to run to coffee break, but could we go through slides one no. more just quickly? Yeah. Can we just, yeah. So we get those important results. Are you asking me to talk more? Yes. That's always easy for me. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, so that is an excellent question. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, so um, since this paper was pretty much done, we started asking that question, actually. So <laughs> more than two treatment groups, right? This is, so, so now um, the idea is you have um, not just maybe a control and a treatment, but a control and then different levels of treatment, OK? So I'm just going to summarize. So now we have a set of binary indicators. This is mu these are mutually exclusive, right? So you see one of these is one and the rest are zero. So you're only in one, one group with one with W1 probably being the control group. And we're still interested in, so all treatment effects are linear combinations of these means, okay? So the idea is we want to estimate these means most more, uh, more efficiently. And so the idea is, um, so there are two, two kinds of examples, Nadine, you might have another example in mind, but two examples where you can actually apply this is in difference and differences estimation, which is the standard case is you have four means, you know, you, and you use that linear combination, right? And then I was involved with some work um, evaluating the, uh, the cost of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill um, a while back, and this turns out has applications for doing estimating willingness to pay, you know, if you're, for those of you who are interested in environmental stuff. And so the, here's the bottom line. Um, let's see if I can jump to this quickly. So, of course, the, the, the one choice, if you have random assignment, is to just average within each treatment group, and that gives you your estimates of the means. And the other choice is to do a pooled regression adjustment where I've set this up so that now you demean the x's in, instead of putting in an intercept. So this is, you simply add the x's to the regression that includes just the dummy variables. And then full regression adjustment is what it was before. You simply, you estimate a regression separately for every group that you have. Now, you might need data to do this, but hopefully you have enough data. You know, you only have to have one or two good predictors in X to, to achieve efficiency gains, right? That's, and so what happens is, so this is in progress, we do know these results, um, is that, again, you never do worse using full regression adjustment, okay? And this is now described in the usual, in the, the kind of matrix sense is that the asymptotic variance of both the simple mean estimator and the pooled regression estimator, when you compare it to the full regression adjustment, these differences are always positive semi-definite, which means any linear combination is going to be estimated more precisely using the full regression adjustment than using either the pooled or just the simple difference in means, okay? And moreover, we do have the nonlinear stuff worked out for this now as well that, that came just fairly recently. So yes, you could actually do a separate logit for every treatment level that you have. And then, so I'll, I'll, I'm happy to send that along when we have that written up, yeah, okay. All right, so uh, this is, so that, that was actually the last slide, which I already said is that in the case where, so this is, in a sense, it's an extension of the, the paper that I just presented to you with only the two treatment groups. Yeah. Great. Can I ask question? Of course. <laughs> on parametric work on treatment. So could something like that, that framework, be applied to here? Another excellent question. Okay. Okay. So here's where I think this maybe could go, is um, you could, so the non-parametric seems too hard to me, 
because they're a tuning parameter. And you don't need to see the, the non-parametric stuff. That's really best in the case where you really need to get the mean function right. See, here you don't because of the random assignment. And so I think doing linear regression or looking at the nature of your y and using a logit function or an exponential function, I think that's probably where the benefits are. However, there's the other issue of how do you choose the x's that show up there? Should you put an x1 cubed? Should you put an x1 squared times x2? So for those of you who've been following the, you know, the, the big data machine learning type revolution, that's where I think that could actually be used here is there's no real, um, you know, you're choosing the x's to try to get a little more efficiency using like lasso or some regression tree stuff. And, you know, the asymptotics for that would have to be worked out, but um, I'm quite confident it could be in this, in this context. So I think maybe using more like the machine learning stuff is going to be a bit more fruitful here. That's off the top of my head. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry. What about kinked designs? Kinked designs are like the. Uh oh. <laughs> Looks like I might have to punt on that, as we okay. say, and we'll talk about. You can explain to me what that is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. We should probably stop and go have coffee, right? Yes. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we're about to go on our coffee break, but before we do, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Professor Wildred so much for taking the time to come here to WeCon and for his very interesting and edifying presentation. I'm sure we got so much from it, and I know that the um, graduate students in particular are very happy. So thank you very much.